So thank you all for coming. I'm Summer. I'm the curator here at the museum. I have just a few announcements before we get started. So first, everybody, please take a second to turn off or silence your phones so we don't have any disruptions. Um, as you probably saw as you're walking in, we are under construction for our new permanent exhibits. But our grand reopening is scheduled for May 1st. So you can mark your calendars for that. We are currently selling tickets for our Mad Hatter Tea Party on Sunday, March 28th at 3 p.m. Tickets are $25 per person, and we only have a few spots left. So contact Thea as soon as possible if you're interested. And her card is um, at the table if you need her information. And then for our museum members, our annual meeting will be this coming Monday. March 22nd at 5 p.m. in Baker Hall, and it will also be streamed on Twitch. Um, for our upcoming programs, our April Brown Bag Lunch on the 7th will be with Gary Powers, who will talk about his father's involvement in the U-2 spy incident during the Cold War. And then for our third on third on the 16th, we will have Al Pertuz, the president of Nassau Habitat for Humanity, discuss the organization's work to help achieve home ownership for low-income families on the island. So those are my quick announcements. And I'll now turn it over to the curators of tonight's exhibit. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. We're so pleased to welcome you to the grand opening of the 2021 student exhibit. This year features the 1920s with the theme of glitz, glamour, and growth. We've, over the last few year, months, we've curated an assortment of panels, artifacts, and interactives from the time period. We're so excited for you to finally see it. My name is Bethany here, and this is my second year volunteering at the museum. Hi, I'm Kyla Dempsey. I'm a junior at Bernardina Beach High School. I worked on the jazz panel and then the fashion and polling interactive. Hi, my name is Adrian Fernandez. I'm a senior at Bernardina Beach High School. And I worked on the intro and conclusion panels and I was involved in the previous student exhibit along with Bethany. Uh, my name is Emily Pipkin. I'm a junior at Bernardina Beach High School and I helped make the nightlight panel and I also helped construct the polling interactive that you'll see downstairs. As you know, we do have guests here tonight to speak to us. They are the Norman Studio Silent Film Museum, a nonprofit organization formed in 2007 to protect and preserve the history of silent film and to celebrate the African American experience and the role of filmmaker Richard E. Norman in the early days of the movie industry. Devin Stewart Leslie was one of the founders of Norman Studio's Silent Film Museum in 2007. She has served as co-chair and president. Currently, she is Vice President for Communications and Webmaster. Daniel Forsyth is the Chairman of Building and is Liaison with the City Department, and he is a Certified Contractor. David Williams is Norman Studios Historian. He's a professional photographer and he uses his skills to document the progress of Norman Studios events and development. Rita Reagan served as a founding mem member of Old Arlington Incorporated and the muse museum's parent company beginning in 1993. She was also founder of Norman Studios Silent Film Museum, and she has served in many capacities and currently as president. Please welcome our guests tonight. You sure it's okay if I take this off? Tell you the truth, I'm pretty nervous. Aww. I used to do presentations constantly in lots of different places, but I haven't done any for the past year. <laughs> I, I've done a couple on Zoom. Those are easy because <laughs> you don't have to look at everybody and think, oh my God, what have I done now? But Devin does them all the time. Devin has been my partner in 
crime or crazy, I'm not sure what it is, <laughs> for so many years, uh, and even though she's much younger, and so that means that she started a lot younger than I did. <laughs> but the building you're looking at there is the uh, front building of a complex that has four buildings in it, uh, and then one that we're trying to reacquire because it was part of the studios in the past. Okay, now, see, I have a, problems with the little, least bit of technology. So, which way goes forward? Oh, you got it. Okay. Um, technology is my greatest joy and my greatest nemesis. <laughs> so, I never know how it's all going to come out. When, uh, Jacksonville was once upon a time uh, known as the winter film capital of the world. That's because lots of different people were running from Thomas Edison and his tyranny with the, the trust fund. Uh, he had a, a trust of all the people that were involved in the manufacture of film. And he had all the patents on all the different uh, equipment that was needed. And he was very uh, conscientious about um, enforcing those patents. But from 1907 to 1919, uh, people started con con congregating here because the weather was really good. A lot of people uh, almost lost their hands and feet because of trying to make movies in the cold and so forth and getting... Um, so somebody took a train on a vacation, stopped in Jacksonville and said, it's here. This is the promised land. And so because, and lots of the people that made their careers here were still famous after, I mean, became even more famous after the uh, talkies came in. Why did they come here? Because it had so many things that were needed for the films. The films not only deteriorated very fast, could combust, but they also had equipment that could burn up people. One of the things in our museum, or in our building, is a tin-lined um, projection room. We used to say that if there was a fire, the people who were out in the screening room would probably be able to get out, but the guy in the projection room was toast. So, <laughs> so but the things about uh, Jacksonville that were so uh, popular and caused a lot of other people to come uh, there were, of course, the river. The river doubled as the Nile, the Amazon, the Mississippi, and everything else in their in different movies. Uh, the beaches, everybody loves the beaches, whether you're making a movie or not, but it was a great place to film. Uh, the skyscrapers, Jacksonville had burned down in 1901. So it was rebuilt and by this time, uh, construction had steel frames. And so lots of big, beautiful buildings, the streets were wide and, and uh, it was just a very nice place. So these are just pictures from some of the films that were made in Jacksonville. The guy over here, is became very famous later. Uh, he was part of the Laurel and Hardy team. But um, all the time that all this stuff was going on downtown, uh, 30, well, we'll get to that in a minute, but um, they were uh, making films, about 300, I think, were made in Jacksonville altogether. But in 1916, this group came a little late to the party. They came in 1916, and they didn't last too long because the whole thing uh, fell apart uh, by 1919. But they came from uh, Chicago, and we're still trying to imitate what they tried to do, which was to build a studio city. They bought land in a place that was almost completely inaccessible. The only way you could get there was by ferry. And so, But he felt... Uh, the, they, this group, you see them, the Eagle Film Manufacturing Company coming down to Eagle City, which was what their hopes were. They, they thought uh, they had lots of uh, good visions of what could happen. But what they would do is try to, uh, to convince the other studios downtown to move over into this area. The land was cheap. Come and be part of the, this new facility. Did I say Studio City in California? Okay, well that's what they were trying to imitate. Here they are trying to get people to buy property there. This is what it looked like uh, when they built it. There was that the first building there was a cigar factory. It was built in 1900, and then there were uh, four more buildings that were built. The one down here is uh, was the stage set building, 
and you can see they had a water feature and lots of things. And uh, this is just an article that we got off of Microfish, and it's got it looks like it's been redacted, but it's not really. It's just you know, so we couldn't get all the all the words to come up. Okay, we had 30 studios. They were making lots of movies. It was doing well. So what happened to the movie industry in Jacksonville? Well, a number of different things happened. First of all, a new mayor got elected, and he was hostile toward all those bohemian people that were running around Jacksonville doing things that they ought not to be doing. But the act, epi epidemic, the, the, we had a problem just like we've got right now with the flu epidemic in 1918. So that was a big factor. Jacksonville got quarantined at least once. World War I had destroyed the film markets, so it was very hard for people to get the kind of circulation they needed. One of the big reasons, though, was that Hollywood, which had been growing in popularity um, and sort of vied with, the, uh, with Jacksonville uh, early on, but it was a desert, and it took two or three days to get there from the film center of the country. Um, but they found water. <laughs> they discovered that they could pipe in water, so the desert turned to a, a garden. And Hollywood was just just getting started, and they were very happy to be a company town. Jacksonville had, was an established insurance center. It was a tourist center, and they just didn't want to be, you know, they weren't going to pass the laws and have things the way that these people wanted it. Oh. Uh, but when I said there were antics going on, the people that were... Most of the companies were pretty, you know, upright, but some of them were pretty um, sketchy. And they did things to save money and make the movies cheaper by setting a fire someplace and uh, pulling the uh, lever for the fire and the police to come, and they got freeze footage. So <laughs> that kind of peeved the, uh, the city fathers, too. The other thing was they did crazy things that were scary to the people that lived in town. They would have ch car chases. Everybody loves car chases, right? Well, they were doing it even then. And they'd run the car right off into the river. <laughs> and they would jeopardize the health and life and safety of the people who lived there. So uh, there were a lot of things that uh, very much aggravated and uh, caused the demise. You can see Richard was so good looking, he could have been uh, an actor as well. But he grew up in Middleburg, or rather he was born in Middleburg, mostly spent his, uh, they, the family moved up to Jacksonville uh, when he was about eight, and he learned about movies. Uh, he got a little bit of training in it, uh, mostly got training in, ph in pharmacy because his father was a pharmacist, but he went off to make movies, and he went mostly to the Midwest. He was making a kind of movie called Townies. Um, that was where he would convince the city they needed a promotional film, and then he would hire people locally to be in the film, and then everybody in town would come to the film to see each other. So um, he made about 40 of them, 40 different cities. We were on uh, um, Roadshow. Antiques Roadshow. Antiques Roadshow. My memory bank over here. Um, and they, they did an um, episode trying to find any movies, because they figured in all those 40 cities, they'd find a film somewhere, because he always left the film after he'd left town. Uh, but while he was messing around up in the Midwest, the West, and part of that time was in Chicago, he saw a film by Oscar Michaud, and that that really triggered a thought in his mind that he wanted to do something that was worthwhile, and so that's how he got into the race films. Uh, and race films are movies that are made with uh, African American cast for black audiences. And they're supposed to be aspirational. People were sick and tired of the awful movies that the way blacks were uh, portrayed in the movies at that time. One of the movies made in Jacksonville, for instance, was called Coontown Suffragettes. But the one that really made people so angry, African Americans, that they, they had to fight back. And that was Birth of a Nation. It's the most egregious uh, type of racism you can imagine. But the only thing is that that guy that made those movies, uh, D.W. Griffith. Griffith. Yeah. What, what is his initial? D.W. D.W. Well, anyway, he was a fantastic filmmaker, 
And so therefore, they, um, it's still living. It's still used in film schools, but it was horrible. Um, so that's how he, the great thing about race film is that the, the African Americans didn't have to wear blackface, which they often did. And besides, most of the black characters were wearing, they were whites wearing blackface. And they played all the parts. Um, this was one of the pivotal persons in this whole saga of Norman Studios. Peg was a vaudevillian in La Villa. Somewhere along the line, they got together, and he became uh, an absolute, um, it was perfect for Richard, because Richard is trying to sell um, black theaters and so forth on playing his movies. He's a white guy. What's he know about race film? So he would go along and help do the um, breaking the ground for them. And he would also do a ballyhoo out in front of the theater and get uh, people to come in to see the film. So he was invaluable. And they continued to travel together for years. One of my great dreams is to have a movie made about this, these road trips that they would take together. Uh, the most, the only movie left of the ones that Richard made uh, is The Flying Ace. And it was um, inspired by Bessie Coleman. And they were in correspondence, and she was coming to Jacksonville for an air show. And, he, she said, and so they decided that he would start shooting while she was doing uh, events at the air show. But unfortunately, it was a horrible accident, and she was thrown out of the, a plane and died, and then the plane crashed immediately after. Then it exploded, and all the evidence was gone, so nobody ever found out exactly what happened and so forth. Um, but he needed a hero. He had part of a plane built, and so we think that he turned to Eugene Bullard, who had actually been a black hero in the Second, uh, First World War, but from France. He'd come from Georgia, a little town in Georgia, but of course he couldn't be in the, he couldn't do any of those kinds of things here. So he went to France and he was, he got the Quartier air and lots of other things. He was super famous. But all that was taking place in the 1916, 17. And so we think Richard must have read about him and that's how he used him as the role model. And the main character, the main girl in the film is sort of modeled after Bessie. And she's learning to fly in the movie. Our big thing right now is to reunite the entire campus. There are five buildings all together. Uh, in 2000, in 1999, the, the owner that bought the property after the family sold it, uh, bought this par portion of the property. And uh, they want to sell it to us, and we want to buy it. We just got to find the money to do it. So that's about it. the whole point here is we want to mimic a lot of the things that have been done here. We do a lot of stuff, but no way. Uh, for one thing, all the buildings are gutted. So we've been working for uh, seven or eight years now in buildings, putting up exhibits that in places where you can, certain the materials are limited because the heat and the roaches and the rats and various things like that. <laughs> Those little minor things, you know. Um, after Richard stopped making films, um, commercial film, um, um, feature films, his wife, Gloria, who was a frustrated actress, she started a dance studio in that building, what was the, the church. Uh, my husband is very graciously giving me signals. How far, how much time do I have left? Five minutes, okay. Because <laughs> I'm a blabber. I'm just getting started talking and I can't shut up. So he's often told me when people's eyes glaze over, shut up. <laughs> we have reunions a lot of times. With, she taught dance there for 44 years, and we sometimes have reunions. Uh, year before last, we took the uh, and made, put an exhibit up at the Cape Museum in Gainesville, and it was pretty successful. And then we put another exhibit up, and we were going to be doing traveling exhibits, but unfortunately, a lot of things have changed <laughs> this past year. Our plans for the future. Uh, are to create a hub for silent film. We want it to be an international attraction. We think that's possible. We're very uh, aspirational too, <laughs> because we get a lot of co correspondence from people all over the, um, all made in Europe a lot and, and in South America, and they ask permission to show, you know, to put, put portrait, um, paintings up and so forth, or posters. But uh, we think it can be done. It's just a long, hard road. I've been involved in this since 1993, and you came in very shortly after that. So.
But this is what it looked like when we finally convinced the city. It took eight years of lobbying wow. to get them to buy the property. And this is what it looks like. Well, it did until the painters started working because mm -hmm. the, the city is now doing a rehab of it and so forth. But it, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get there. And this, uh, these are the art, architect's drawings and so forth. Um, we, when I wrote this program the last time, we thought it was going to be about $2 million overall that was spent. Hmm. We're going to have a 60% finish for this first $1 million that we just got uh, uh, done. There's another million sitting there waiting, but we don't know for sure when they're going to turn it loose and to finish the job. But these are our things that we want to do. We want to uh, make this a place where, well, for one thing, Arlington used to be a really uh, one of the best neighborhoods to live in. It has become much more uh, a harder uh, economic thing. All the businesses, a lot of business businesses are gone. We think that we will be a catalyst to bring people in. Uh, so. The only thing we need is support. Lots of money, lots of volunteers, and if you want to know more about us, you can go to normanstudios.org. Uh, I usually do this, it takes me about uh, you know, half an hour to 45 minutes. So I did this particular presentation for an organization called PB&J, which we're trying to do another big project with this time. And so they had rules. There were four people participating that night, one of the city council, I mean the uh, school board chairman and uh, I mean uh, superintendent and so forth. But you had could only have 20 slides and 12 minutes. <laughs> so I thought that might work in this space here. But the story is very, very poignant of what it took to bring this these people, uh, the Richard and his family, who started this whole thing. Um, out there because nobody knew who we were. Nobody knew our names, so to speak. And now we're a National Historic Landmark and we are uh, spending a million dollars, the city's spending a million dollars of tax money and we're trying to raise money for the exhibits and, and a lot of other stuff. So hopefully we'll be able to invite you to come down and see the place. Um, we have, we do presentations, mostly Devin does them because she's the, not only is she gorgeous, but she's also a technical whiz. So we just, she did, did four for, Cal, uh, for a program out in California, and she does them all the time because she can sit down and whack them out real fast. But uh, we hope that the time will come when you all will come down and visit us in our finished, because we've been working in a very, very difficult area, you know, with this gutted building and so forth. Now, would you all like to add anything that you, um, I, I left out tons of stuff, uh -huh. but what are some of the things that you think that I've left out that would need to be, they know, need to know about? Um, I think the, the most important thing to, to really understand is how important this, this project is, not just to, uh, to our town's history, to Florida history, uh, and to film history, but also to civil rights history. This was one of the first places where African Americans were given uh, a fair shot uh, in films as cast and crew, uh, their stories were told in um, in, a, in a way that wasn't, uh, you know, all, all the, the mainstream films that, that, you know, during that day, uh, African Americans were, were always portrayed in a terrible light. And this was one of the first uh, opportunities that they had to be portrayed as, you know, doctors and aviators and adventurers and lovers and you know they were they were good guys and the bad guys and um, and that happened right here you know and every town has its you know it's it's good history and it's terrible history um, as it relates to you know to uh, to race relations but this is something that our area I think can be very very proud of and it's something that we we really want to you know to be able to, to get out there because a century later the industry still is not where it should be in terms of Representation uh, and you know and just the number, the diversity and the numbers and you know and uh, I mean we've we've made an awful lot of progress, but we also have a long ways to go before we're you know before it's a really truly diverse uh, diverse industry that it should be. Absolutely. Aside from that, I feel that it, it speaks volumes to race relations within the chaos that is America because you have a gentleman that was from, I can only assume Middleburg was not probably a very ethnic mixed town and to come up with an idea to try and push an African-American film. But Arlington in particular has like a rich history 
of race relations, period, like from the Spanish period. So it's only right to try and see something through. And I just jumped on board on this, what, two years ago? I saw you at a town meeting, and it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I rode by that building. I see it. <laughs> what's going on. So I want to, um, yeah, it's, it needs to be. Right. They've been working hard. At well, we, we're, we have to fight a battle almost every day with the city about what they're doing. Because this is a rustic building, you know, old-fashioned uh, farmhouse type of building. And the family lived upstairs, Richard and Gloria and their one child. Um, and so there are many things that we want to save and keep, you know, um, as part of the overall display. But we want to put very modern um, exhibits in. And so we're fighting right now about what kind of uh, um, fire suppressant substance to use. Because every our goal is to have every one of the exhibits with um, some sort of... of um, technological stuff. We will have a character. He's an animatronic character that's being donated by the um, Sally Corporation. You may have heard of them before. They go all over the world making, putting up exhibits and so forth. But it's been a long, hard ball because nobody cared. You know, for the in the first uh, first eight and nine years, nobody really cared. They didn't understand it. And now we have correspondence with people all over the world, and we have people in the city that know. What what it's all about and so forth. So we we think we've made a lot of a lot of progress and we got a long as she said a long long way to go. Um, anything else that you can think of that you'd like to add to? Um, I believe that I mean just on a whole and whole. I mean just on the historic preservation side. I mean you're we're sitting in a building that probably somebody wanted to demolish it at some point in time. Everybody does just to have a piece of property still standing. I mean it's a wood structure. So man, that's you got termites, you got any number of things, but it's still be standing speaks volumes. Which is just the fact that it's still standing is is surprising to me. The, I got involved. I actually lived a couple of blocks away. I've always lived in Jacksonville. I've always been a little bit of a history buff. I had heard the the I knew about the silent film history and uh, and about the Norman story, but I didn't realize that this was a building. Well. Meanwhile, I was passing this building every day, you know, going to work and out and about on, you know, um, you were a journalist. Around. Yeah, and uh, and I always, I always thought, even even when it looked the way that it did in, in that top picture, even when it was falling apart and it, I mean looked like it would fall down if you breathe in this direction, there was still just such a cool vibe about it. And I remember passing that building so many times, thinking I would love to buy that building, I'd fix it up, I'd live upstairs, and I'd do something you know cool and creative you know downstairs. And when I finally put two and two together and realized that that was the Norman property, that is exactly what happened there. They lived, uh, they lived upstairs, and they did something cool and creative and groundbreaking and history making uh, downstairs. So it's just a, it's very, it's very cool to be you know to be part of you know. I didn't get to buy it and fix it up and live there myself, but you know to be able to. Practically can't live it. Well, yeah, um, but to be able to be part of, uh, of uh, you know, seeing it come back and uh, hopefully come back full circle to where we will be able to, uh, you know, watch the the young generation come in and hopefully do something, you know, some cool creative stuff uh, there again. So. I'm working with a uh, a grandfather in um, out in Seattle right now. He is working on his finishing his dissertation, and he has done something very interesting. And he started this several years ago, so we've been corresponding off and on for a while. But he wanted to. He worries about the fact that the African American community does not have access to filmmaking, so they're not very well represented in in the, the industry. So he, he and a people that he's rounded up around have been making a film uh, strictly using. Not never seeing each other face to face, and of course, when he started this five years ago, that that was really amazing that they could do it. Um, now everything's being done that way. Everything's on Zoom. So, uh, uh, but it is interesting. And he sent me his film. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but uh, I, I'm interested in seeing. In other words, African Americans are stepping up again. Once upon a time. They had to be convinced that they were worthwhile. That's why race movies came along. They were very aspirational. Now, uh, 
we've had all these years, and yet things, as she said, hasn't changed that much. So a lot of different kinds of things are happening. And of course, there are uh, famous people. <laughs> we, we once had a, a visit from a guy named Reuben Cannon. He was deeply involved. Well, he was the cast uh, director for um, Color, Color Purple. Purple. And uh, we had, and he worked also. There's a famous story in its own TV of him having a battle with Oprah Winfrey because he couldn't believe that she had the nerve to be lobbying him about uh, having a role in that movie. Uh, so they they faced off against each other on her show one time. It was hysterical. So if you ever get a chance, Reuben McCannon, Oprah Winfrey. But he also was working for years with a Tyler Perry. So I didn't necessarily want us to make a Medea <laughs> at the studios, but I, I would have taken it if we could have gotten it. But um, we're still looking for our sugar daddy, you know, the person that can buy and uh, pay for all of the um, accoutrements that are necessary. The opposite of Richard, who was such a fiercely independent person, when his business went down uh, in 1929 after the he had spent an awful lot of money in uh, inventing a, a, a system for making talkies, and so, and it was successful. And he was selling his machinery for six thousand dollars a pop. And you think about that in the late twenties. Um, but unfortunately, um, Edison once again popped up. <laughs> He'd been the genesis for movies coming to Jacksonville to begin with, and Western Electric figured out how to put the sale on, on the film. And of course, that really destroyed the hope for uh, his machine. He went bankrupt, but he continued to do. He was offered jobs in Hollywood because he was considered a great filmmaker, but uh, he he wanted to be an independent, and so um, he did. And he continued to work until he was until he died in 1960. I think that's enough. We want to hear. One of the things that we wanted to know was about your all's experience. Tell us some of the tidbits about your experience making a exhibit. We've been there and now we're trying to figure out how to make the big experience, you know, how to put it all together. We hired a person and that person hasn't worked out you know, to, to do the concept plan. And so, uh, it was very, um, like, well, me and Kyle, we made a, we recreated a uh, 1920s polling uh, system and it's very homemade because it's there's only like three types of images you could find online of what it actually looked like and there's only a couple like links that you could see on how it worked and there was even even the like polling questions even more scarce like it was so <laughs> hard to find anything about polling in the 1920s um but it was interesting to learn about like how it worked and how they did it back then and then when we were actually putting it all together i feel like First of all, the research was really interesting for me personally. Like the amount of research that we had to do, and especially getting to see stuff in our own hometown, like the, uh, stuff about the Palace Saloon, that was, was low key a drug place, but it was also an ice cream shop. So it's just kind of interesting to be like, oh, that's nice, <laughs> very kid friendly. Um, I think it's wonderful because you usually think of people that get involved in history at all as being the older people, mm -hmm. and so to have people like you all dive deep and do an exhibit and so forth. How do you think? You think you'll be taking uh, Summer's place one of these days? <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, I, doing this has made me realize how much more I actually like history because I've always liked the class, but actually getting to see more of like a local standpoint, mm -hmm. like I really like it. I don't know if I'll ever make a career out of it, but I definitely, like when I go to college, I'm probably going to take more in-depth um, history classes for sure. And you'll be enriched and you'll be able to enrich all the people you work with. How about you? Um, I've always sort of had a passion for history. Um, I'm not sure if I would follow it for like a job or something, but it's definitely like a good, it's interesting to just look up stuff and you know, random facts. I would always, uh, when I was younger, I would always pester my parents about random history facts. And I think it's just very cool, and, you know, kind of like a hobby or something. Well, we hope the legislature doesn't pass a new bill that they've got up, which is you can only get uh, the Bright Futures grants and so forth yeah. if you follow a, some sort of course of study that deals specifically with a job that you can go to directly. Mm -hmm. Like everybody now has a job even though they've got a degree in whatever the yeah, thing I is. have a degree in history, so don't waste your time. Don't waste your time to What about you, Hood? Um, I, I've always loved history. I um, could definitely see myself continuing to volunteer in things involving history, and I just think it's 
amazing how when you start digging into the even something as simple as jazz, um, I found out so much about just Bernardino involved in jazz and like American Beach in particular was a really big spot for jazz back in the day because of all the jazz clubs and it was a really big spot for African Americans. And there were even um, some very famous names in jazz who came down to American Beach and performed. So knowing that those big people came to our town and it's crazy because living here my whole life, I never thought of, of Bernadina as like this big cultural or important place, Definitely. but going into the history, all of the big people, the big names that have either visited or even come from Bernadina and the area is amazing. It's still, I mean, Jacksonville is still a part of, uh, I mean, comedians call it still, it's still referred to as the Chitlin Circuit, the Southern Mason-Dixon area. So, I mean, it's not uncommon that today you still find, I mean, like you spoke on Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry started off doing his shows and theaters, running the same chitlin circuit. A lot of comedians still do it. So it, you, it's still happening now. You're still like now, you'll still see artists that will blow up in the future. So. Did you run into any pirates? <laughs> um, no, not particularly, <laughs> but um, I'm sure there are some. There have, are definitely pirates from Argentina. Not in this time period. Yeah. Well, we do have we do have the pirates. By the 20s. So. We do have like the pirate club in Bernadina, so you could say that they're pirates. <laughs> what about you? Um, I probably wouldn't pursue history as a career. I've always enjoyed science, but I love volunteering here because I love the application of history. One of my favorite parts is researching the panels to write and also going on to the archives online and getting to look at all the artifacts that are in the archives here at the museum and getting to pick which ones to put in the exhibit and then research them further and write captions about it. So that's one of my favorite parts about all here. Well, I'm sure that uh, we'll all be enriched by your all's work here at this particular time in your lives and so forth. Uh, are there any questions from the group that you'd like to ask? It was such an abbreviated uh, presentation. There's so much more that we could have talked about. So I just wondered, have, had, had you all known about Norman Studios? Did you know it existed before? <laughs> yes, sir. What exists now? <laughs> well, we're the only complete movie studio of, of the era. Either the, any kind of movie studio, whether it was one that made a typical uh, white films, and we're the only race film studio in the whole country. But is there something started. to see? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yes. there's five buildings total. Um, four of them are uh, owned by uh, the city of Jacksonville, and we have the, the um, our contract. Uh, we you know we uh, run those as a as a nonprofit. The fifth building is owned by uh, a church. And um, they want to sell it back to us when you know when we're able. But uh, it's the five buildings. Um, there are uh, a couple of um, there's what three or four uh, generators that uh, Mr. Norman used uh, back then that are uh, that are still there. Yeah. Uh, some of his equipment. Um, and we you know, we're starting to we're starting to to find artifacts. And you know, as as uh, you know word gets out, people will call us now and then and say, hey, I've got a I've got a great old projector or, you know, some different things that, you know, so we're starting to get some, what was it, um, not was it to collect or? artifacts, but okay. as of right now, it's the, the building, what? mostly just the okay. buildings and, and, and the generators. Are you accepting yeah. visitors now? Oh, big, yeah. Not right now yeah. because the, the main building is uh, under uh, renovation right now, fun. but we're hoping, you know, um, and that may take, what, about a year, Rita? Yeah. Well, according to our meeting when we had with the contractor last uh, week, mm -hmm. yeah. December, so and so first floor, I said, okay, it's just the first floor. First floor. Remember, we started with a million dollars, but they ran into so many problems and so forth sure. that uh, they don't think that they'll, we'll be able to have anything except the first floor uh, done in that length of time. And if they do, I'll be, uh, it'll be a miracle <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But, but they've done work, at least. <laughs> the, the church is right over here. It's the one I showed you that had the pool out in front of it and so forth. Um, some of the famous people that did movies in in uh, Jacksonville, though, were Fate of Era and uh, the, all the uh, Barrymores. <laughs> all of them made a movie here at one time or another. Tom Mix, if you happen to be like Westerns. Uh, but that was before it was still just the uh, white 
uh, regular studios at that time. Um, but Richard coming home to Jacksonville, we wouldn't we wouldn't be a national historic landmark if it, if that was all that there had been in Jacksonville. It was the fact that they made these movies. There's one of the great scenes in The Flying Ace where the villain has kidnapped the heroine and they're uh, flying and the hero is chasing after him in his plane and <coughs> the villain's plane catches on fire. It turns over upside down and um, then the hero flies over the top of him and drops her a rope ladder down on her, and she climbs up the ladder to his <laughs> plane. Oh. Yeah, the miracles intense. of uh, a <laughs> it's, it's intense. <laughs> but Kevin and I went to New York, and we were at uh, a, a conference in a the center. What's the name of the center? Lincoln Center, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, when you take your baby to see people for the first time, you wonder if people think it's cute or like it, and so forth. <laughs> well, I felt that way about this movie. So these are sophisticated New Yorkers. Were they going to like our little movie? Well, there's the play, the cards that they put the words on behind the film. At one point, the guy on the ground is saying, climb, climb, climb. And all the people in the in the theater are yelling, climb, climb. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been in the San Francisco Silent Film Festival. We've played this movie in Miami at Miami University, all over the place, you know, all kinds of places. And it's always amazing. And we're lucky. If we could only have one of his complete films left, we're so, so grateful. It's The Flying Ace because it's beautifully done. And I tell you, I started this and I didn't, I didn't like silent film. I'm too close to that era. You know? <laughs> but there's a skill and an art with silent film that I had no idea what, you know, what a, a magic uh, phenomenon it is. You know, the word fan comes from fan, uh, fanatics. Well, these people are fanatics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a really terrific guy coming from Washington. He makes films for the uh, Veterans Administration. But he's coming and he's going to be on our board. He's retiring to, to Ponte Vedra. And he's going to make uh, join our board. And we need more of those kind of people. Because not everybody yet appreciates um, silent film. Uh, more so in the rest of the world than here in Jacksonville. So, so just just to, from that image there, the only things that aren't standing is uh, that whole row of structures on the left hand side. All those buildings are standing. The one where the water tower is, and that little one right in front of the water tower, that's no longer in existence. Yeah. But the far right one is the one that's the church. No. That, but it's all you'll those see buildings it. are standing. It's not minus it's over here on the other side. And underneath, uh, I think what Rita you said. That was the pool, so they actually had a pool there for the water scenes, and there was a pool. Like she, she left out a lot. <laughs> there, was a, there was a pool that, uh, what you said, they just started throwing stuff. So once, like, the excavation, once that happens, and you start getting out there with sonar, I can only imagine the goodies that are just. Devin is waiting to get a Chase Lounge. <laughs> yeah, she probably will. There's, there's a beautiful Chase Lounge that sends some of the. Um, the uh, photos of the uh, set pieces. And before um, Captain Norman, who was a filmmaker's son before he passed away, uh, I asked him one day, hey, Captain, where's, you know, where's the, who's got that lounge? I'll, I'll pay you a hundred bucks for it now. He said, oh, I think it's in the pool. <laughs> yeah. Broke my heart. We wanted to do a, 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 a preliminary, just a tiny little uh, thing, dig to see what might be there. Uh, but the church didn't want people, they didn't want the publicity. They did not want people coming in there and digging, you know, <laughs> and uh, on their property and so forth. But that'll be a fun, when we're able to do that, that'll be a fun project that we hope to um, connect uh, with uh, some of the archaeology students around here. And those, those kind of projects where we can, um, you know, include other uh, bits of the community that, n that normally wouldn't necessarily you know, have have a connection with you know with film, um, and any time that we can, any time that we can work with students, you know, we love that too. So. Um, yes, when, sir. Go, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, when was that put on the historic register? Uh, um, Twenty uh, sixteen. Okay, and and so you know that's a real important thing for your fundraising. I know. But you know, I what? guess are you working with Wayne Wood and uh, the 
Large the sad or... part is that that and a million dollars <laughs> would help us finish this project. The thing about a National Historic Landmark is it, is it helps to keep it from being torn down, which is a very big deal. But it also, but it doesn't. There are the right. If we can find the right kinds of investors, um, we'll be okay. Right now, we have to get most of our money, and we don't have any entrepreneurial stuff right now. We do Silent Sundays. We had been doing them for five years, and we got the first one done in 2020, and then we, everybody closed down. What is there uh, quarterly silent film screenings that we hope to go back to soon? We started them doing them monthly. They got killed, Devin. <laughs> Were you going? Is that it? Do you have a comment? Huh? No. Okay. I wanted to know what Silent Sunday was. Ah. Uh, Silent Sunday is where we play silent films. Yeah. Uh, uh, she had a, a, a question back there. Oh, I had a question about uh, do you can you recommend any films that were filmed in Jacksonville that you can watch? Oh yeah. Flying mm -hmm. asses. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the first one during the first part, in the first twenty years that it was when it was just uh, white film like girls making films. Um, <laughs> the very first one we did as a silent Sunday though mm -hmm. was. A Florida Enchantment, I think. Yeah, that was it. No, Florida Enchantment is about all the hillbillies. Uh, this was um, that was the very first movie made in Jacksonville, and it was uh, the people in Jacksonville hated it because all of these people. The narrative was wife gets killed by her husband. He drags her into the swamp <laughs> with the alligators eat her to get rid of the body. <laughs> and so everybody in Jacksonville was really, really upset that we were being portrayed as these uh, pitiful crackers. They, Jacksonville still gets a bad rep. <laughs> <laughs> However, all the people that saw the movie all around the country said, oh my God, did you see the scenery? Did you see? Uh -huh. And of course, one of the places that was very popular to make movies was uh, St. Augustine because Flagler built an incredible city. And so, like the river subbed for a lot of places, <laughs> that one subbed for Baghdad and every other place in the world because of the great architecture and so forth. Yeah, you're talking about a Florida feud, though. That's a Florida, Florida feud. Enchantment. You're the right. The, the Tell them about that one. Okay, uh, Florida Enchantment was the, the first, um, a, uh, was the first one that we did for Silent Sundays, and it was, uh, it was filmed in St. Saint, in Saint Augustine. And the storyline, um, I won't give too much away because you know it's it's a fun uh, fun movie to watch. But the storyline is a a woman thinks or um, is it a her husband? I mean her boyfriend, yeah, her fiance. Yeah, is is cheating on her, and uh, somehow or another she comes across this magic being or, <laughs> that if you eat it, you know, um, it changes your gender. And so she decided to do that for what I, I'm not sure what she hoped to accomplish with that. But everybody does did. that, just eat and whatever. And so it yeah, and so it was it was the first film where um, there were uh, nuances of um, of uh, you know of, of uh, That's first cross dressing movie. and yeah and um, and it just depending on the mark you know on where it was played there were people all over that were just you know like this is. This is absolute trash. This is absolute mm -hmm. evil. You know, there were a lot of places mm -hmm. uh, where it was, um, yeah, yeah, it was, it, it was barred. You, and uh, just, you know, the New York Times just, you know, ripped it apart. You know, it's, it's <laughs> how awful it was. But you look at it today's time. It's, you know, it's comical. It's so uh, mild. Not, yeah, so <laughs> mild. Yeah, but it's just the difference in, in, um, in how how films were, um, were. You're just taking it, and and that's one of the things that was interesting to me about um, about silent film was back then everything was marketed town by town, uh, and each every film was subject to the local censorship laws. Mm -hmm. So the same film, you know, goes to this city, and they have no problem, you know, with uh, uh, with with the sexual scenes, but. But if there was a character that was, you know, uh, fighting a, a, a law enforcement officer or something, they couldn't do that, you know. So you had to cut that part out. The next town might be completely different. Violence all day long, but don't be showing, you know, so, don't, yeah, so um, scantily clad women. And so the film, you know, would have to get, you know, cut up um, in so many different ways, just depending on on what town it was in. And the problem with a Later, it was a problem even then, 
But the problem when Richard was doing this, he was a one-man uh, show. He did everything. He did the writing, the filming, the uh, promotion, uh, his story alone of what he did to make to be able to make movies and so forth. And people ask all the time, was he uh, an integrationist? Was he a person who was dedicated to the whole concept that, I think, two things. He was a pragmatist, and he didn't like anything where the big guy took advantage of the little guy. And I think that was his thing. You had a question back there, and we've been ignoring you. Oh, I was, I was oh, just asking yes. what kind of films you only named one film. <laughs> um, um, yeah, there's, um, I think we have a list of it, a uh, list of that. If you go to IMDb and put in uh, films that were made in Florida, you'll see a lot of the earlier ones. But, but a Florida Enchantment was good. Um, what was the Rudy Valentino film? Um, well, Theta Bear was Bear, a fool there yeah, was. Rudy Valentino there. was the, uh, it was his first movie where he played, um, became a sex Hero after yeah. that, you know. What is the name of that movie? I'll have to look it up. Um, but, uh, and there's also, if you look up um, Billy West, uh, he was a, a local actor who was a, um, a uh, chaplain impersonator. And uh, so there's some of his films that are still still around. Uh, there's, there's quite and a few. And Stan, I mean, Laurel Hardy, the Laurel and Hardy team, was uh, the, the big guy, Babe, uh, the, he made a lot of films here in Jacksonville, and we think he made at least one at Norman's, what was Eagle Film City at that time. Uh, he went on to become, you know, but the guy that really was successful that made movies at the studio, or at uh, Norman, what was, what has become Norman Studio, was, um, oh God, this is why I don't do these kind of presentations anymore. Billy Slade? No, the, never mind. I'll, it'll come to me and I'll tell you, I'll come tell every one of you. <laughs> <laughs> you had a uh, I was kind of more interested in your organization as a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit confused because you said the city of Jacksonville actually owns mm -hmm. the buildings and the property right. and it's right. historic and all yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So you started the nonprofit. Uh, in 16, is that right? No, no. Um, 2007 is when we formed it. But in 1993, uh, when mm -hmm. the local group of people got together and founded an organization called Old Arlington Inc., uh, that's the first group. That was in 1993. And I was participating in that, you know, all those years ago. But they decided it was too big because they wanted to focus on revitalization of the Arlington area. So we formed a new nonprofit then, which is Norman uh, Studios Silent Film Museum, Inc. <laughs> so does the city of Jacksonville, because they own it, do they have any say and or do they give you any money no. towards it? They have spent um, a, a lot of money maintaining the property and they we helped them raise the money to do the rehab, the additional rehab, to go from that <coughs> falling down mess that was there to what it looks like sitting there now. Uh, but they only did the exteriors. So all the time, uh, our operational funds, we have to raise ourselves. And we will have to raise the money for the exhibits. And uh, it's hard. But the work but, that's going on now, the million dollars. Yeah, the, right now, the um, and there's another million dollars sitting over here in a CIP fund. That's Capital Improvement um, Fund um, project. But that's five years out. So if we actually finish this first phase in December, that's a long hike in between. Mm -hmm. So we're working right now to try to change that, move mm -hmm. it up closer, and raise money. We've always been, it's hard, I don't know, is this property owned by the organization or is it owned by the city? Organization. The organization. And we'd love to be able to do that, but we have, we've been this little group that's just been scrounging around for so long because we couldn't get any traction. And one of the problems was we had to fight against the city. The city has, I hope none of you all have relatives in the government in Jacksonville. But it, my husband used to be a city councilman, so I, it's okay if I talk about him. But um, the fact is the city has had a bad reputation about um, historic properties. Yeah, they pick right. them up and that's then they don't do anything with them. Right now, we have a 20-year-old uh, complex of buildings downtown, and 
somebody now maybe has the money and they're going to do it. And the city's going to put a lot of money into it. But they've, they've gotten stuff back or picked it up or uh, advocates like us have convinced them to buy a property or whatever and then it just sits there and molders away. So it was hard to get people to invest the money uh, because they didn't think the city would go forward with it. And we couldn't find a way to raise it and buy it from them and go on with it. So so part of the, just to further, so the city owns that where that line is in the middle, the city owns all those properties there. The church, the white building, that is privately owned. And that what church is, is it? What kind it, of a circle of faith ministries. So that's privately owned, and Devin, you had some numbers that they were trying to sell it. To. That's that's something that this nonprofit is mm -hmm. actively attempting to purchase right. individually right. from the church, right? And they will have that operate independently right. uh, so from the yeah, city. Yeah, we wouldn't turn it over to the city no, if we get it. No. We it would become our entrepreneurial area because we could do an awful lot of things there that we can't do. On city property. On city property. Do you even know how much it costs? I know what they yeah. have, what they're asking for it. Seven hundred fifty thousand. Uh, of course, you couldn't buy, couldn't get that on the market. But, but they're wonderful. They have been such good stewards of this property, and they, when they did the rehab, because it was in about as bad a shape as the other buildings are, um, they took care to take care of it and make it keep the historic elements and so forth. And when we went, when we applied for the uh, National Historic Landmark, they cooperated. They're on the property. If we get control of it, then it, it can go right along in, in, with no problem at all. That's a, that's amazing for a little church to take on that kind of burden. So we, we owe so much to them. It's a little a small black and evangelical church. And they've just been incredible partners. We've done lots of stuff with them. Anybody else have a comment or? Uh, yeah, we have time for maybe one more question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would tap dance if that would help. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kind of fundraising do you do to raise this money? Well, let me give you an example. Is it only by donations or? Uh, well, for, um, grants is the other thing. The biggest cash donation we ever got was ten thousand dollars from a person that did not want to be recognized. They didn't want anybody else coming and asking for it. But we we did a, a program for our benefactors uh, a year or so ago, and it's amazing because this is in kind things like the hotel that provides our place where we do our movies. They've they've donated more than twenty five thousand in uh, you know the stuff that they do for us, including popcorn <laughs> for the movies. And it's that kind of thing, but but for the most of our money for operations, you know, to be able to send out stuff and that sort of thing. Thank God we live in the digital area uh, era because we couldn't do it if we had to have everything printed. One of the things about Richard's stuff, it's over a hundred years old. One of the grandsons has a lot of stuff. They've been carefully storing. They gave away a ton of stuff to the Library of Congress, to the Lilly Library in uh, Indiana. The uh, Center for Black Film, etc. But the stuff is still in great condition. Most of it's been housed in garages and places like that for all these many years. And it's just beautiful. You know what a poster, a 4 by 8 poster sells for now? About $7,000. <laughs> just one poster. Most of our most of our fundraisers have been you know more small scale. You know, Very like small the, scale. The, um, the style of film screenings that we do uh, that we do quarterly that we hope we'll be able to get back. Um, but we are looking right now at ways to um, you know to, to do bigger scale uh, fundraisers and also online fundraisers. One of the ones that we are uh, working on right now that will probably happen, I believe in uh, I believe it's set for September, but we're uh, we're in talks to have a um, a very recognizable name that I can't you know put out there yet, but uh, do a um, uh, do an introduction and a uh, Q and A uh, to the Flying Ace, uh, play Flying Ace, um, and that would you know that'll be online via Zoom, and uh, you know having people would would pay a you know fee to to see the film and to you know to talk with a you know with a, a name actor for for a few minutes. So the um, so the lockdown really has been, I mean at first it was scary. It was like well, we're what do we do? You know, we're, we're kind of done, but it actually has forced us to 
look at ways to uh, to get more creative about uh, fundraising and and uh, just getting our name out there. And it, it actually has helped, it, you know, because before this, you know, we probably would not have gone um, have done so many uh, of the, the online outreaches. Well, you know, you can be anywhere in the world, you know, and and if you're interested in silent film, you know, pop mm -hmm. on. So that's. That's something that we're working on now is is figuring out how we can really you know leverage you know what we've learned there and uh, some of the the more widespread uh, uh, you know awareness uh, that we have now. But if anybody is good at writing grants and talking to people out of their hard-earned money, we need you. <laughs> and if you know anybody who lives that lives in the Jacksonville area. Uh, we won't have to make this trek every day, although one of our board members, one of our most prolific board members, is uh, uh, she retired from University of Florida, and she handled the K Gatorade account for 30 years. And she comes from uh, from Gainesville all the time yeah. for meetings. Now she doesn't have to come all the Zoom, time. Yeah. She comes on Zoom. You were going to say something. I was just going to say, um, just to speak on that, there is a website. Um, you can go to the website. It has information. It also has a donate. Mm -hmm. button. So, <laughs> so, right on the there's page. a donate button for everybody to click in here. <laughs> We've had a couple of crowdfunding type things too, a GoFundMe type of things, very small ones. And we're going to, that's how I'm going to try to raise the money for the animatronic figure because even though he's donating it and it's worth about $48,000, and we're going to, but we have to change him into George, to Norman. He's a, a, a 20s director. But uh, no facial that they made. Face. But he looks, you know, when he gets a different uh, clothing and a different uh, hairdo and so forth, he will look very much like a, a Richard. But there's a lot of things. We've not had the kind of leadership. Most of our people are starving artist types. That's what they've been for most of the years. The people who cared about this kind of thing. And so we've had people come and go, but it's taken so long. Everything has been so hard and the city has not been the best partner ever but <laughs> but they you know they they've gotten the word now and i think that we'll be doing a lot better from this so i think we're on. at a good time now because you know race relations is um, is a, a very you know a big issue right now and two uh, over i would say the last decade there's been a resurgence in interest in um, in classic and particularly silent film and i think um, in part because of um, people like George uh, George Lucas, who is very big into um, into film preservation, and people too just realizing that you know we're a little over a century now, and so many of the, the early films are are gone. You know, yeah. um, every now and then, you know, but 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 there's still there there are a lot of them still out there. I think more than more than we realize, we've lost so much, but. Every now and then, you hear, you know, read a headline about, you know, a Chaplin film found in a garage in Iowa or something crazy like that, you know. And I, I, my hope is that one day we'll find a, another, another. Devin is film. the hope but springs I eternal. Am, yes. I am. <laughs> and one time, uh, a one family when film. the people came from uh, um, uh, on the antiques roadshow, oh. a couple gave us a film. Uh, here's. Devin. They said the only thing we've ever been able to see on this was somebody in a cowboy hat. Mm -hmm. Well, Devin was working on a grant to write and make a, a documentary about Bill Pickett. She got in her car, she packed this film in ice, and right. drove to Washington to the Library of Congress. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, it that's turned out to not be what we were hoping <laughs> it was, but it was a fun trip anyway. She also <laughs> tracked down Bill Cosby. He was one of the many celebrities. We've oh, done pitch yeah. packages, you know, all the time. I chased him for a while. I'm kind of <laughs> glad he turned it in now. <laughs> Never mind, Bill. It's been up. Yeah. <laughs> but now, every now and then, because she strings for and, and People Magazine, too. Yeah, so and, she'll have to take off to chase somebody else down, but and, not for And no, that was because Bill um, had collected some, some Norman stuff. Mm. We got wind of that. And, yeah. yeah no. I think it's time for us to shut up and uh, <laughs> move on. Go see the exhibit. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. So everyone, feel free to head downstairs and enjoy the reception and exhibit.
Do you go down in the elevator? So where do you go after you get down there? I mean, so everything's under construction. Wait for the crowd, but it's basically if you go down the elevator, you go towards the left. And it's going to be to the left of the front door. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the website is what? Are there any clubs in Jackson? Norma Studios.